My name is John Breeding, and I've been asked to speak about how people actually get diagnosed mentally ill and what what's up with that in a practical sense, mostly. One of my teachers, Thomas Zotz, who is pretty well known to most of you, and if he's not, he should be. He's one of the, probably the preeminent uh, teacher about how psychiatry works in this country. He's about 86 now and still writes books. <laughs> but he was saying that when he first became a psychiatrist, you know, 50 years ago or whatever, more than 50 years ago, I guess, there was maybe a handful, maybe seven or eight mental illnesses that were said to exist, right, you know? <clears throat> well, in 1952, the American Psychiatric Association created the so-called DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, of the American Psychiatric Association is an attempt to sort of classify and describe different so-called mental illnesses. I'd say that book was about this thick, probably. It had 66 so-called mental illnesses in it. It was considered a great scientific advance from the time before that, when things were diagnosed by such things as phrenology, you know, where you measured bumps on the head or in 1950 when this book was published uh, called The Varieties of Delinquent Youth. I suppose it was an advance from phrenology. They, they diagnosed by body types. So this one's first order psycho psychopathy, right? You know, so supposedly sort of your body type, the shape of your body would show. This is second order psychopathy, a different body type. See, so this is a diagnostic uh, manual for delinquent youth that was published in 1950. Medical insufficiency severe. See, all based on body types. I suppose that was considered a great scientific advance at the time. It's interesting that it came out about the same time as the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. <clears throat> a few years later, in the 60s, that edition was expanded to include a hundred or so diagnoses, and it's been revised a few times since then. The latest one, I believe, is DSM-4-TR, fourth edition revised. It has about 400-ish diagnoses. As you can see, it's quite a bit thicker. Got many, many diagnoses in it. This book holds the codes you know, which are the key to the medical health care insurance system. So everything's labeled, you know, with numbers. So you have like 315.00 and 315.31, expressive language disorder, 315.32, mixed receptive expressive language disorder. You know, you have these different codes and categories, and they vary with different numbers. So presumably, if you have... Um, 297.1 delusional disorder and 297.3 shared psychotic disorder or 293.81 with delusions or 293.82 with hallucinations. You know, those are scientifically discrete categories and separate diseases and illnesses with different codes, all of which access uh, insurance dollars and all, all of which justify the idea that this is a scientific medical enterprise and therefore, you know, justifies scientific medical treatment like electroshock and drugs. So the DSM is really the key. The important thing to understand, is this is a diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders, right? Well, people have written books about this, and I really want to recommend a couple of them for those of you who really want to go into this. Stuart Kirk and Herb Cutchins have one of them, and Paula Kaplan, C-A-P-L-A-N, has another. Both great books on basically how the DSM was invented and how it works and that kind of thing. I'm just giving you a nutshell version, which must include the fact of saying that there's really nothing statistical about this and there's really nothing scientific about it either. How it works is like this. <laughs> Thomas Zotz said that Medical doctors use pathologists to prove disease. You get that? You know, that you prove a disease 
with a pathologist who does a blood test or an autopsy or whatever that finds the objective physical or chemical abnormality, the sign that connotes the disease that's been validated previously in the scientific literature. Medical doctors use pathologists to prove disease. Psychiatrists use lawyers. Okay, that's one of his great aphorisms, and it speaks volumes. None of these listings of mental disorders, a euphemism for mental illness, is scientific medical data. There are no ways to find objective physical or chemical abnormalities in here. There's basically descriptions categorized into so-called syndromes or patterns according to somebody's opinion about behavior. The way that diseases are ultimately classified in medicine is called laboratory tests in scientific medicine that are validated in the scientific literature. In psychiatry is called committees that vote in a committee room or a conference room or a hotel room on whether somebody's description of behavior ought to be classified as a mental illness. This is why you get phenomenon like homosexuality at one point was really in there in the DSM in a mental illness and another point is taken out because of social and political pressure, social and political decision. Very, very clear. Here's a couple. Oppositional defiant disorder. Wow. A pattern of negativistic, hostile, defiant behavior. Loses temper, argues with adults, defies, refuses to comply, annoys people, blames others, angry, resentful. You have four of these and you qualify. That's how it works. Conduct disorder. Repetitive and persistent pattern of violating social norms, basically. Bullies, fights, used a weapon, was cruel to people or animals, stole something, destroyed property. That would, might be in the past have been called delinquent behavior. It might be called bad behavior. It might be called aggressive behavior. But here it's it's a disorder, it's a mental illness, right? You may consider these things eccentric or whatever, but the bottom line, and again, you know, as, as Zotz would say, is that any behavior or misbehavior cannot be a disease. It's just not. That's not what disease is. So you know, this is called disorders, but what we're really talking about is that's a, that we're talking about mental illnesses. That's how you get. That's what you get classified with, and that's what gets you into that system. It's real simple. It would almost be funny if it wasn't so tragic. Because what we're looking at is just, you know, some doctor's judgments about what's within the realms of normal, or some doctor's mandate to classify that as mental illness so that those social problems can be controlled by this profession called psychiatry. Peter Bregan said mental illness is in the, I mean, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, mental illness is in the eye of the controller. Psychiatry is the agency of social control. This is the mechanism. Zotz wrote a great book called The Manufacture of Madness, subtitled A Comparative Study of the Inquisition in the Mental Health Mo Movement. The Inquisition had the Malaeus Maleficarum. It was the big book that the Inquisitors would use to how to diagnose witches by pen pricks and drownings and, you know, looking for warts and all these different things. This is the Malaeus Maleficarum, the witch's hammer of psychiatry, the DSM. It presents under veneer of science, but it's not. The Malaeus Maleficarum presented under a veneer of sanctity and religion, but it wasn't. It was about power and control. Mental illness is a metaphor. It's forgotten that it's a metaphor. It's treated as if it's real, and it's used to co coerce and control and intimidate and frighten people and to limit the ranges of expression and eccentricity in life. And it obscures any legitimate and real understanding of human distress. 
Because once you've labeled it this way and called it an illness, and in today's world that means you're biologically or genetically defective, that's where the drugs and the shot come in. It obscures and denies and negates the possibility of real support and community support and authentic help and safe asylum for people who are in distress because that happens. But it has nothing to do with illness. Mm -hmm.